Uh, yeah, today's message is very practical. This is not uh, this is not a deep message. This is not. Um you know, I just, uh, and this is more of a chat, uh, but I, but I want to help us with, uh, with some things this morning. When you open up your Bible, if you, you know, if you've, if you've, uh, read your Bible through you, you, uh, maybe you've done it for the first time recently, you know, whatever the case is, you're, you know, many people are unsure. They're intimidated. It's a big book. It's a, it's kind of a heavy book, you know, and, and oftentimes people are intimidated by the Bible and they say, well, I don't know where to start. And, you know, but, uh, the Bible's divided, you know, kind of into two main sections, the old Testament, which was written to Israel, the, the Jews and, the New Testament is kind of more uh, written uh, to to Christians, the the, the Gentile uh, world, uh, the, the world of Christianity, and so on. Now the Gospels are are a little bit different. If you're reading through, you get to the end of the Old Testament, you get to the Gospels. The Gospels are technically kind of still Old Testament books. Because Jesus, the, the New Testament didn't begin till the cross. You know, when Jesus died on the cross, that's really when the New Testament began. And that's why we read many times as you're reading through the Gospels, and sometimes it's confusing. People look at that, and, and Jesus is teaching Old Testament principles and traditions. He's not talking about trusting him, and that's because he hadn't gone to the cross yet. So there's, you know, there's answers to that. But it, it can be a little bit, uh, you know, difficult sometimes to understand. The book of Acts, then, is as you're reading through, the book of Acts is a transition book. It's taking us from Judaism into Christianity and, and, uh, and, and so forth. And, and then we come to these books, the next books, written by the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul wrote most of the New Testament. The books of Romans all the way through the book of Philemon were all written by Paul. There, most of those were letters to churches. For example, the church at Corinth, that's where we get First and Second Corinthians. The church at Philippi, that's where we get the book of the Philippians and so forth. And of course, they shared among themselves, and, and that's, how, that's how the Bible sort of uh, got, uh, got into people's hands and, and so on. Now, the, but three of Paul's letters... Three of his letters were a little bit different. They were actually written to pastors. That's First and Second Timothy and Titus. And uh, they were written to the pastors of churches. They're called the pastoral epistles. And, um, and we're going to look today at First Timothy. We're going to look at some passages here in First Timothy today. Paul is writing to Timothy about issues that he needs to address with the church. So he's saying, Paul, or he's saying, Timothy, th these are the things that you've got to deal with if you're going to pastor the church. Now, I think it's, uh, you know, it, it's it, it, in, you know, and in essence, he's, he's writing to all pastors, but it's pretty interesting, I think, as a pastor that that's where Paul said most of his really controversial stuff. You know, he, he didn't say, you know, in the book of Philippians, for example, he wrote, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You know, those things that you put on, you cross stitch and you put them up, hang them up on your wall. Those, those just beautiful, peaceful, loving sayings. But then he says to Timothy, now, Timothy, there's some things you need to talk to about the church, but I'm not going to do it. <laughs> You're going to do it. Now, I think we all know it came from Paul. I mean, it, it, it came from him. And so we all understand it came from him. But I just think it's uh, interesting. Most of the controversial things you find, you find in those pastoral epistles. He left that up to the pastors to, to deal with that. So let me give you an example. Let me just give you an example here. First Timothy chapter 2 and verse number 11. Ladies, you better put your seatbelt on here. Would, would any of you like any of you men like to come up and read this for us? <laughs> Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection, then it gets worse. You know, he, but I suffer not a woman to teach or usurp authority over man, but to be in silence. Wow. How does that play today? <laughs> These verses, I mean, most people say, yeah, those verses really didn't age very well, right? They're like, now don't worry, I am not preaching about that today, okay? I'm saving that for Mother's Day. So, <laughs> just, just kidding. Some of our guests are like, I'm out of here. Stay, stick around, stick around. <laughs> you know, I, 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 but he goes on to talk about, you know, he goes on to talk about, you know, things, other things that he talks about pastors and deacons, for example, and, you know, that so-called list of qualifications for a deacon and, and uh, you know, elders and, and things like that. For example, in 1 Timothy 3 and verse number 8, he says, likewise must the deacons be grave and not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy of filthy lucre and so forth. You got all these, uh, these things. And he goes on to talk about money. He goes on to talk about gossiping and, you know, a work ethic. This is the passage where he said, you know, hey, if a man doesn't take care of his own family, he's worse than an infidel, and uh, you know, and, and, and so on. And so, some pretty hard things, really harsh things. And at one point, he reminds Timothy, Timothy, 
So these things that I've told you you need to deal with in the church, not everybody's going to like it. Well, duh, <laughs> you think? He said, yeah, not everybody's going to like it. And there's going to be a little backlash and, you know, and, and, and so on. Look at, look at 1 Timothy 4, 6. But he says, but you got to do it anyway. He said, if thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things. By the way, let me take a time out. Ladies, don't, we don't believe. It, that's not what it sounded like either. It's not, it is not that women have to be silent in a church, and, you know, and it's really not even addressing women so much. It's a whole different message, and I, I can't get into it today. But just let me just say, if you're, if you're thinking that women have to be quiet in church, that is absolutely not the case. And I certainly don't want you to be that way. Amen. Uh, unless you're thinking about yelling at me, in which case I want you to be quiet. <laughs> but, Yeah. So, but the psychology, you know, here's what he said. He said, if thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, you'll be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine, whereunto thou hast attained. He was saying, you know, you, you, you're going to do a service to your people by making sure you do tell them the truth. You tell people the truth. You honor people. I said at the funeral, the, one of the first things I said is, look, we're going to talk about who Glenn Hollingsworth, I do this at every funeral, you know, because you don't honor somebody by lying about them. I've been to so many, I've been to funerals that, you know, done where the person was literally a saint. I mean, the guy never did anything wrong, never, never said, you know, and it's like, okay, I know that's not, we all know that's not true because we're all human beings. And, you know, so you honor people by telling the truth and you, and a pastor can only be a, a you know, do right is what Paul's saying here by telling people the truth. It doesn't do any good that you're, you're hurting people by lying to them. So, but here's the thing, here's, here's, that's really not the message today. Here's what I want to get at this morning. It's the psychology of what Paul says, to whom he says it, and why he says it that I think we should consider rather than the content. In other words, instead of, you know, instead of the content about what he says to men or what he says to women, the specifics of that, instead of worrying about that, we need to ask ourselves, why is he saying that to men? Why is he saying this to women? Why is he saying this particular thing at this particular time? and so forth. So the, let's look at an example. All right, let's look at an example. And uh, it will explain, I think, why Paul writes what he writes. And, and I think we can learn something about ourselves. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 8. Let's go back and let's watch this. Here we go. He says, I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. Now there's a lot of, there's a lot could be, you know, parsed out of that verse, but I just, you know, the, what we're talking about here is Paul said, look, men, you need to pray. You need to pray. Now, it seems kind of obvious though, doesn't it? I mean, prayer is kind of one of those fundamentals of church, right? It's fundamentals of Christianity. It's like, you know, prayer and the, the, it's kind of one of those, why would you need to tell them that? Well, why did he feel like he needed to tell men they needed to pray? I'll tell you why. Because men need to be told to pray. Yeah. Not every man. I get, some of you men are the, you know, godly prayer wars. I get that. But by and large, within Christianity, let's be honest, men need to be told constantly, you need to pray. There's, there's something about, you know, there's something about that, you know, it, it, and it, okay, well, let's, let's continue on. Look at verse number nine. So then he says, in like manner also. Now he's connecting the next verse to the verse that says men need to pray. He says, in like manner also, women adorn themselves in modest apparel. So, he told men, you need to pray, and he's telling women, you need to dress modestly. Now, from a content standpoint, you look at that and you say, well, what do those two things have to do with each other? Because he says in like manner also. In other words, along the same lines. And it's like, what is the connection between, now some of us, you know, I, I, there's some of you saying, well, if you got women running around not dressed very modestly, it's going to be pretty hard to pray. Right? <laughs> and that could be an application of it. I get that. I get that. But... But I think it's much deeper than that. I think it's much more important than that. He connected these two things because, again, men need to be told to pray, and women, they need to be told to dress modestly. Because there's something in our nature that, that men just don't by nature, men are not by nature the prayers, you know, traditionally in the church, traditionally in the church. Now, our church is a little bit different. Thanks to the men's group that Mauricio started and the way that you all get together and encourage each other. And Harold, you send out a devotion every morning. I think it's a little bit different here, but let's be honest. Traditionally speaking, if you've been a part of churches your whole life, you know most churches are populated by godly praying women. They're just better at it. 
You know, you don't have to tell a mother to pray for her kids. Men, on the other hand, fathers, on the other hand, tend to just want to fix their kids themselves. You know, that's, there's just some why. And again, I know I'm not speaking universally. I get that. But generally speaking, this is why Paul addresses this letter the way he does. He says, you've got to tell the men they need to pray because they probably won't pray if you don't tell them to pray. And you've got to tell the women, this is your, this is what you need to focus on. You know, you know, what does, you know, okay, you know, why, why you need to tell men to pray again, because they need to, you don't have to tell women to pray. You know, why, why? Well, let's consider, let's, let's consider this verse. Why not tell men to dress modestly? Because it really doesn't make any difference. I mean, let's, come on. Come on. I mean, you know, men are hideous no matter what they wear. In fact, in fact, men look better the more they cover up. I'm just preach. I'm going to preach the Bible whether you like it or not. And nobody in here wants to see our deacon board come in here in a Speedo. <laughs> that's not even, you know, and that's not even really an issue of modesty so much as it is an issue of, ew. <laughs> right? I mean, you know, we, we, you know, so, no, look, not all men struggle to pray. Not all men, not all men struggle to pray. But the reason Paul addresses prayer to men is because he's addressing the, <coughs> the <coughs> excuse me, I'm, I'm sorry. <coughs> he's addressing the fact that they just don't naturally do it. And, 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 and so men, you know, we're, we're reminded that, hey, we need to be better about that. And, and, and by the way, ladies, this verse is still in effect too. You know, God is, God is still, God still cares about, uh, you know, about all this. And again, we could debate all day long about what that means and modest apparel and so forth. But, but it's, you know, it, but it's also true that not all, not all women are, are prayers, but he's, he's, Paul is just addressing the natural tendencies and, and, uh, and so forth. The, the, the things that limit our ability to share the gospel with our community. Mm-hmm. See, look, men who don't pray, men who don't, uh, you know, don't care, men who don't get a, a burden for things may not, may not, uh, you know, look at this world and care enough. But when you pray about somebody, you pray about a group of people, you pray about a, you know, a segment of our society, you become burdened for them. And on the other hand, you know, women who don't dress, you know, modestly that, that there's an issue there and there's a, there's a whole different, it, it's pretty hard to talk about Jesus when someone's distracted by, by, by the way someone's dressed. Yes. So, these are the things that limit us, but it's, it's, I'm going to leave that portion of the message because it's not, this isn't even about men praying. It's not even about women uh, and how they dress or, or, or the potential uh, for, for harm there. Here's the part that we can really learn from. These are the, these are the uh, issues when we talk about these issues. You know, when I read the verses about women being silent, I read the verses about women dressing modest apparel. When I read the verses about men praying, these are the issues that get a rise out of us sometimes. That, that uh, you know, uh, okay, for example, you tell a man, your shirt is too tight. You know what he's going to say? Yeah, I put on some weight, you know, I got to, you know, I need to, I need to deal with that. And you tell a woman her shirt's too tight. You see the difference? You see the difference? You know, you know, I, I, no one has to tell a man, not since the early 80s, no one has to tell a man to button these buttons, right? I mean, I know it's a thing in the 80s. That's not a thing anymore, unless somebody's stuck in the 80s, got the mullet and the, you know, and the chains and all that. Yeah, I get that. There's probably that somewhere. But, you know, nobody has, you know what, you know what our problem is? Our problem are these buttons. <laughs> They unbutton themselves. <laughs> so, you know, but you don't have to tell men that, you know, and, and, you know, we don't, we don't deal with those kind of issues, but you tell a man that he needs to pray more and he's likely to tell you, mind your own business. You, you tell a mom or a grandma, you know, you need to pray more. And you know, that, that godly lady will probably say, you know, you're so right. I do need to pray more because my children are this and my grandkids need this and this world is doing this and I got this experience. See, they will take that on in, in such a godly love and such a prayerful uh, attitude. You know, you, you see how different this is. And again, I know it's not universal. I get that. 
But generally speaking, that's kind of where it is. So here's the question that I have for you this morning. You know, when we, when we, you know, we, we get to that. Um, the question this morning that I ask is, is actually what my title was. So when you read your Bible, which parts of it tick you off? Which part do you get to and you say, well, I don't like that. Well, I got quiet in here real fast. <laughs> so you like, yeah, you like it when I, you like it when I talk about the, you know, the men, you know, let's go back to the men in prayer. You know, a man will tell, stand there and lie to you and tell you he prays when he doesn't. <laughs> so I get the women back on the side now. Okay, here we go. <laughs> so which part of your Bible ticks you off? When you read, oh, nothing. I, I love every part. Really? Really? I could co- pull some verses out for women and for men and for kids and for all of us. And I promise you, you're not going to like. We all, we all, th- which are the parts that we tend to get to and then we just sort of skip over those? It's like, yeah, you know, I don't know that's, you know, you use that shovel technique when I say something here that you don't like and you say, boy, that's good for the people behind me. And, <laughs> you know, I mean, why, what, what is it? What is it? You know, what is it that irritates us in the scriptures? Which parts do we skip over? Which parts do we try to, which parts when a pastor starts talking about it or you read it or, or I read a verse and, and immediately your mind goes to justifying it. Well, it's like, well, but he doesn't know my situation. You know, that pastor, he doesn't know what's going on. You know, again, this is in all of us. This is our nature. We have a nature inside of us that is resistant to hear the things that really affect us most. It's what the Bible, it's what God continually said to his people. You're a stiff necked people. You know, he said, you're, you're a stiff. Now, what does that mean? That means they're just, you can't, you can't affect me with anything, you know? And, and he said, you know, you can't be like that. It's the things that hit home that are supposed to hit home. But here's the great part. God isn't telling me to look at you and say, well, you got this problem. You need to do this differently. He's just talking to you. It's just you and him. So don't run from that in scripture. Don't run from that when, when there's preaching or there's teaching or, or, you know, just, just say, look, God is just simply talking to me about the area of my life that is probably not where it should be. You know, I, you know, for example, do you know who loves, do you know the people who absolutely love the scriptures and preaching about women dressing modestly? Well, let me tell you who it's not. It's not the men. <laughs> By and large, look, this is a church of honesty. Most of the time, most men are pretty cool with women dressing immodestly, and that's a shame. Oh, well, truth hurts, man. Truth hurts. You know, but I'll tell you who loves that kind of preaching women who dress modestly. They love that. They want to hear that because, because that's something they believe in and they feel bad, you know, they feel passionate and they feel like this is how I honor God and, and, and it's good. I mean, but they're the ones who love that, you know, who, who, uh, you know, men who pray love to hear, love to hear teaching on prayer. They love that, you know, people, okay. Generous people love to hear messages about giving. So people who don't like to hear about giving, <laughs> you, you see the point. You see the point. We all have, we all have little things that uh, that sort of are that that, that are sort of burrs under our our sound. I just want us to consider this morning, what is God trying to show us? You know, it's 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 time that we all understand. And I think Glenn was a wonderful, wonderful example of this in his life. Glenn came to the point where he understood that God loved him because of him, not because of anything he'd done good or bad. And that's how we all need to understand things. So when God deals with us with something, when God, when, when something upsets us in scripture, whether it's talking about gossiping, how we use our tongues or whether we, how we, uh, you know, how we treat people. And, you know, look, I, i I feel guilt constantly about my road rage. <laughs> it's like, well, God, look, I, I mean, I'm trying, but these people are just stupid. 
I feel like if Jesus really were my co-pilot, he'd be ticked off too. He'd be rolling the window down. No, he wouldn't be. <laughs> you know, it's, it's good to be honest with God. I, I guess the point we need to understand is we can be completely, absolutely, 100% honest with God. God has broad enough shoulders that he can handle it. If we say, you know, God, there's a part in this book that I really just don't like, and I think you're even wrong about it. He'll be glad to listen to us talk about that. Moses did it. I preached that a few weeks ago. Moses argued with God. David argued with God. David was not a perfect guy. Read the Psalms. I've mentioned this so many times. You know, read the Psalms. Most of those Psalms are David saying, God, would you please kill my enemies and make it hurt and, you know, and do it in a really vicious way. I mean, David was cold-blooded in some ways. But he was honest with God. He didn't hold back with God. And God isn't interested in us trying to pretend like we're not, there aren't things in the Bible that sort of set us on edge. But he is, does want us to know those are probably the very things we ought to be looking a little closer at. You know, it's the same way with people, isn't it? Most of us, most of us, if you have somebody in your life you don't get along with, it's probably because you're a lot like them. That's how it works. Two alphas, you know, so on, you get the idea. So let's, let's be honest with God. And let's, as we're studying, as we're reading, as we're listening to messages, as we live our lives, when, when something kind of comes up that just sort of gets a rise out of us, let's consider what is it that God wants me to do today? There are many people, and I, I'm closing with this, there are many people that, in fact, I, I'm thinking of a man, he was, here, he was here not too long ago to hear his child sing, but he doesn't come to church on a regular basis, and I'll tell you why. Because he says every time at the end of the service when you talk about death and you talk about going to heaven or going to hell, that kind of, that kind of you know, typical kind of stuff, he said, it just, it just scares me. But he can't bring himself to believe. Can't bring himself to believe. So he's terrified and that's why he doesn't come to church. Isn't that sad? It ought not to be that way, should it? So let's not let one of our issues keep us from drawing close to God.